Hello everyone. Now, what am I doing now? Well, for starters, I'm not sure if you can hear it, but the travel lodge I'm in has a lot of background noise. So, not much to it. But I'm away. And I'm hoping the day this comes out on the Sunday, I will be doing brew ships from here. I even have the iron brew all ready for it. However, the Wi-Fi here is Imagine all the words that could be said while I was drinking. Bad. It's terrible. But in good news, whatever happens tomorrow, I'm hoping to record some 60 second videos with this. And this. Yes, I brought the floppy torpedo with me because I want, I'm going to do some torpedo themed 60 second videos. So, needed the floppy, uh, floppy torpedo. And this is my um, <clears throat> traveling buddy, Nuts. I'm not sure if I've introduced on the channel before, but yes, I'm a 30 something year old man, and everywhere I go in the world, this fellow comes with me. Mainly because. When I was very young, what ended up burning off his tail would have hurt me severely. So my theory is, seeing as he's already sacrificed part of his tail to keep me in one piece and safe, he must be lucky, or at least the version of a bodyguard. And because whenever I've travelled with him, I've been fine and haven't had any problems, got home safely, I'm not saying I'm superstitious, but um, you, 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 it, it, why break something which is a good track record? Why fix what ain't broke? So he comes with me. I promise that at no point in any 60 second video will I be tempted to do that. No, I won't. And I said that without crossing my fing uh, my fingers, possibly my toes and feet. So what am I doing talking to you at six o'clock by recorded video if I'm going to be doing a live from seven? Well, A, I'm using the time this is going to get me to hopefully find a takeaway to bring back here so I'll have some food to eat. And B, I thought I'd talk through the books I brought with me while I'm away because I'm a historian. I do not go away without books. They come with me. Here you go. I've got Andrew Lambert's The British Way of War, and mostly I have been focusing on a very specific chapter. And that chapter is The British Way of War, which is a kind of interesting chapter, but it has a specific section in which I really quite liked, and I thought I'd read to you. Recognising the limits of the evidentiary base, Corbett left room for future inquiries but set on the principles. In periods of tension before war, control tended to rest with the cabinet. Important wartime operations were usually submitted to the cabinet for approval after they had been agreed by key ministers. The, those ministers had a wide discretion and the operation was rarely discussed again at cabinet unless the expertise of other ministers was required. While the key issues were naval or military, such meetings were not necessary. But major changes of plan or of relation of allies did require a cabinet. Individual ministers could not disclaim responsibility because the issue had not been presented to the cabinet as they had a theoretical right to call for a meeting. In each war, the government invariably ended up placing the direction of war in the hands of as few men as possible. After 1790, the Prime Minister represented the Sovereign as the Chief Executive at such meetings. The connection between the current War Council and the Cabinet was as hard to define as has any previous secret committee, but it was only the latest example of a recurrent practice, 
the Prime Minister decided if he needed to call a cabinet or some form of secret committee, and Preston suggested that the other ministers were responsible for the outcome. Corbett closed with a discussion of the practice in the Crimean War, the last major conflict. Drawn from a parliamentary inquiry, Prime Minister Lord Aberdeen, following the practice of Pitt and Liverpool, had not thought it necessary to summon a cabinet through the critical period after they had agreed to invade the Crimea, despite several changes of plan. The British way of war. I love this book. And I love the concept in this book, but honestly, the concept is not new to me because the British way of war has been something that's been discussed for years. And of course, Andrew was my PhD supervisor. Although I didn't have this cool t-shirt when I did it, when he was my PhD supervisor. And I didn't have a YouTube channel, which I should have done. It might not have been the same, but it would have been good to have. But I had been familiar with this discussion for a lot of time, long time before I got this book. I love this book for what it, tell, it tells me, but also for the way it codifies something which has been a concept under discussion for a long, long time. There have been journal articles, there have been papers, there have been whispered discussions in hallways. There have been murmurs in libraries. But what I also find most interesting about this book is the amount of people who decry it who I swear haven't read it. I saw someone the other day who they wrote it off as saying it was just navalist propaganda. No. It's not. It's about a mature, joined up, thoughtful approach to strategy for a medium power, for a unique nation. Because every nation is unique. Every nation has unique needs. You know, Britain doesn't have, at this moment, massive land borders. I've got them with Ireland and as much as I have great respect for the Irish, don't know as I have enough family who are. Mm, that, that's not a really a land border I worry about that often, in terms of another nation invading. The point is, you shouldn't keep going around, and this is what this book makes, saying and comparing one country's strategy to another country's strategy. Yes, they'll have points of relevance and points of interest, but there is no country in the world which is the same as another to such an extent that they can copy and paste their strategy. That they should even consider copying and pasting the strategy because it won't work for them. And the thing is, the strategy also has to fit not just your needs as a nation in terms of your geo strategic, your actual geographical position, your physical geography, but also your human geography, your political, your culture, your society. What are you prepared to do as a nation? One of those things that we keep discussing, keep running back to, it keeps coming up in various forms when people start talking about boots on the ground. I am not naive enough, nor I would I ever suggest it sensible a policy to suggest that, to put forward the argument that Britain should never put boots on the ground or never should put, deploy the army to any other conflict again in the future. I wish the world would be such that we would never have to do that, but I do not believe it for one moment, and therefore it's going to be necessary. But do I think our first instinct should be to deploy boots on the ground versus maybe sending a ship, which is self-contained, 
can deploy it and it can come back on its own. That depends on the scenario. If you're talking about the Far East, more certainly I think send the ship first. The closer it gets to the UK, the more complicated it gets. The more you have to start thinking about alliances and the way our, we work with alliances, for example, in NATO. It makes perfect sense to deploy battle groups with them. Do I think we should re-establish a British Army of the Rhine, but this time in Poland? No, I don't think that would be sensible or cost-effective. I think also by the time we finished establishing it, we might already find that Russia's on its bases, though, as well. We'll leave that to one side. The Cold War is gone. But the Cold War has returned. Or never went away. Or it was never really a Cold War, it was just a continuation of geostrategic politics that had carried on throughout the centuries of major powers and minor powers all playing a global game for power and influence. Which do you think I as a historian subscribe to? Next book is, people keep asking me about where I find archives and research material. There are actual books you can buy that tell you where the sources are. Now, I have the entire free volume set of these. But I have this with me because I'm currently working up in London. And I, this evening, managed to pop by an archive, which very kindly they stayed open a bit late for me to pop in after I finished my work, which is nice. This is the sort of book which has things like this, right? So, this is Admiral Sir Reginald Neville Custis, who lived 1847 to 1935. Naval career. Naval attaché, Washington and Paris, 1893 to 95. Director of Naval Intelligence, 1899 to 1902. Rear Admiral Mediterranean Fleet 1902 to 4. Uh, second in command, Channel Fleet 1907 to 8. His archive materials are at Churchill College, Cambridge. It's a collection of letters from 1909. The National Archives has other details of papers in other collections as well. You might have worked around from those dates. Why was I looking him up? Why did I talk about him? Well, of course, my recent video on Beresford would make that make sense. There's a connection there. There's also a possibility that that's the real fleet commander if they'd gone to war because Fisher didn't have any faith in Beresford. I also have this gorgeous book which has been sent to me. It literally arrived day before I left, and I've been reading ever since, but keeping it in this cardboard. The Fleet Air Arm and the War in Europe, 1939 to 1945, by David Hobbs. A, that is a really gorgeous cover. It's painted by the same gentleman who did the cover of my book, Travels, Battles and Darings. So yes, Anthony, you can certainly paint. Pen and sword are very lucky to have you. But it's a gorgeous book. And it really does go into the details of the operations of what was going on. It's one of those books which you get and you immediately, if you're an academic or any kind of really interested in doing your own research, turn to this rear where you can't in these lights because it's the fabulous travelodge lighting we've not i'm told this particular residence is a three-star hotel uh, uh, anyway um but 
it actually has all the cabinet papers listed out in the archives and all the secondary sources used as well as the primary sources it's just it's just it's wonderful and i do love the way hobbes has been able to list his own books that is something i i, I look forward to the day when i can turn to the back of a book i've written and find a dozen books written by me in there he also brought up an actual book by Vice Admiral Schofield, which I hadn't realised existed, because I have a copy of the Russian Convoys and the Loss of the Bismarck by B.B. Schofield. I do not have Operation Neptune, so I'm going to be hunting that down. That was published, finally published in 70, 1974. Attacks on Norwegian targets by aircraft of the home fleet began with Operation Sampler, an attack on shipping in and near, and near Vagaso. Naran sailed on the 1st of January, but the weather was bad, and with no improvement forecast, the operation was cancelled, and she returned to Scapa Flow on 5th of January. On 12th of January, Premier and Trumpeter sailed from Scapa Flow for Operation Spellbinder, the provision of anti-submarine patrols and air cover for a surface action group attacking an enemy convoy off Ergesund. Premier had the Avengers of eight, five, uh, six naval air squadron embarked together with four Wildcats of 881 NAS. Trumpeter had the Avengers and Wildcats of 846 NAS embarked together with the remaining Wildcats of 881 NAS. SAG sank an enemy minesweeper and damaged the merchant ship off Nord Nordbifjord. Wildcats shot down a JU-88 Shadower, but two of their number were shot down while suppressing enemy anti-aircraft fire. Both pilots were recovered. Another Wildcat had to carry out an emergency landing after its pilot received a head wound from anti-aircraft fire. On the 13th of January, the same carriers carried out Operation Gratis, mine laying by their Avengers off Huggersund after covering the withdrawal of the SAG. The weather was perfect, and the lay was carried out by six Avengers of 846 NAS, each armed with a single Type A Mark I mine, with eight Wildcats as escort, and a further six Avengers of 856 NAS, also with eight Wildcats as, as escort. Three unserviceable Wildcats in Premier were repaired by spare parts flown across from the Trumpeter. Eleven mines were laid successfully, but one was unfortunately dropped in a safe condition by one of Premier's aircraft. All 12 Avengers dropped from heights of between 200 and 500 feet at 170 knots. As the strike force withdrew, fighters strafed the enemy radar in the WRT station at Tissera, but were unable to estimate what damage they had done, and no post-strike photographic reconnaissance was available. No aircraft were lost. Further operation that replaced the cancelled sampler, designated Operation Windward, was, ca Windward was carried out on 20th of January. Campania, Premier, and Narina took part in this a night attack on the shipping between Stratland and Ireland, carried out by swordfish freeze from Campania and Narana. Fighters from Premier, uh, Premier provided cover during daylight. The swordfish were armed with eight three-inch rocket, uh, rocket projectiles and with 25-pound solid warheads, or with four 250-pound bombs. The was clear with full moon, although there was overcast at 5,000 feet near the coast. So the first night shipping had strike by home fleet carriers, it was estimated that two merchant ships had been hit by rockets and had stopped, and that a larger ship had been hit by both bombs and rockets and damaged. Another ship had been attacked with unseen results. German records, fa uh, records failed to confirm these estimates. By this stage of the war, they were neither comprehensive nor accurate. Why did I bring that down a quote? Well, simple, really. The amount of times I read uh, various tweets, etc., of... Swordfish, ah, oh, World War One aircraft. Well, A, of course, the Swordfish isn't a World War One aircraft. You all know this. Well, I know, and I hope anyone who watches my channel knows this by now. If I haven't, if you don't, I have failed miserably in my ta self appointed task as YouTube educator. I will have to redouble my efforts and probably triple my output. I will probably be start that by the point I've broadcast enough. I will be broadcasting in my pajamas because I've forgotten what day it is, but we'll leave that to one side. Whether it's night or day. Leaving that all to one side. Swordfish was still a very good night strike aircraft right the way through World War II, if you were using it in the right circumstances. It was available, 
in numbers of experienced pilots, and it's capable. That's not the sort of combination you turn down. Now, because for some reason I'm doing a lot of recording about cruisers lately, you know, I have this with me. I don't think why. Mm. I do love this book. But I also love where it starts. It starts with the town class cruisers. Working on a new Bodicea began late in 1907. Six ships had been planned for the 1989 program, including one to be built at the Royal Dockyard, Pembroke. Adrian's Bodicea was essentially a destroyer leader, but the new cruiser was much more powerful. The principal role was understood to be that to meet the new German third class cruisers. It's always good when you have to forgive build. Well, how am I put this? When they first end a service, and I'll be getting into this in the video on Tuesday, I would describe the Duke of uh, Edinburgh class cruisers as a torpedo boat destroyer, destroyer, destroyers. But by this point, okay, by the point you have the Bristol class, i.e. the first of the town class cruisers from other one coming to service, well, you know, you now have new German torpedo boat destroyer destroyers. So the town class are destroyers of them. And then the vessels which the Germans have to destroy the town class are now the targets of the Duke of Edinburgh class and their successors. So they become the torpedo boat destroyer, 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 destroyers. Welcome to the joy of naval warfare and construction. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Anyway. Earlier, slower German cruisers would have been ineffective against fast British destroyers, but the new ones could run down the British destroyers for protection, as the German ships would operate against British trade from the German colonies. During the First World War, several of them did just that, and Dylan and Koenigsberg became famous in that role. Probably the ships involved were the first German turbine cruisers, the prototypes Stitten and the Dresden and Enden, all armed with 10 4.1 inch 40 guns, displacing around 3,300 to 3,600 metric tons. The surviving speed was 23 to 24 knots, increasing to 25.5 knots and 26 knots in the next uh, Colbert class. Initial instructions. 2nd November 1907, were to design a 4,000 ton capable of 12, 25 knots armed with 12 4 inch guns, with 50% more fuel, coal and oil, than a Bodicea, the latest scout, with a protective deck but no side armour with 4 month stores. There's no apparent interest in the higher speeds to overmatch the latest German cruisers, the NC can meet those requirements on the desired displacement with the same protection as Bodicea, half inch deck throughout with one inch slopes over machinery and four inch conning tower. The board provisionally approved the 410 foot version of 4,000 tonner, but the DMC asked for more options with thicker armor decks. A, with one inch flat and one and a half inch slope, uh, only over machinery and magazines, 4,100 tons, and B, with one inch flat and two inch slopes, 4,300 tons. A detailed drawing showed a 420, foot, well, between the perpendiculars, foot, um, by 44 foot by 14.9 foot ship of 4,300 tons. The design showed two four inch guns side by side at each end, plus three in the waist on each side. Blocked from firing across the ship by the boiler casing. The new ships were rated as second class protected cruisers because they were powerful enough to fight the last, uh, last British cruisers with the uh, rating, Diana class. These ships were too big to build at Pembroke Dock. A ship had to be docked within six months of the launching, and the yard had no dock long and large enough. So in January 1908, it was decided that one of the six 1908-9 cruisers would be a smaller repeat Bodicea, the others being built at private yards. It was proposed to replace the deck tubes with submerged to torpedo room. That, in turn, cleared deck space for another two four-inch guns. 
for a total of 14, these changes were decided early in January 1980. The direct naval construction stretched a, four, a sketch of a 4,600 ton tonner with a desired heavy armour, one inch flat, two inch slope, the larger gun battery, and some air tubes. The controller considered a four inch battery on, the ship, on a ship this size weak. For a few more tons, she could have six inch guns at the ends, plus the eight broadside four inch. Six inch was considered a natural gun for a relatively small cruiser because it was the largest whose shell could be handled by a single man. Hence, the largest, which did not require a powered hoist and elaborate loading arrangements. They also made the six inch the natural armament of our merchant ships and our raiders, which could be commissioned in significant numbers in wartime. In mid January, DNC ordered legends prepared for their alternate, this alternative, as well as for four six inch guns paired alongside each other at the end, and four four inch guns, and four six six inch guns, and eight to twelve pounders, that's three inch guns, six, in, uh, six inch uh, paired at the ends with another four pair of six inches, one on each side, above the break in the forecast, and 12 pounders on the broad side above them. Although on the 18th of January, the broad approved of the version with a single six inch at the front end, 4,400 tons, the control asked DNC to work out a slightly larger ship with two more waist four inch guns and protected ammunition supply, three inch tubes at the ends and, and the waist. DNC thought that would add another to about 250 tons. In addition, the six inch and four inch guns, the ship was to be armed with a Maxim machine gun, later increased to four. On the 17th of February, Control told DNC, Philip Watts at this point, to pursue this 4,650 ton design. On the 13th of May, he added that all the guns should be protected with three inch shields. In previous designs, the guns were not protected at all. Estimate displacement rose to 4,700 tons. Further proposed detail changes would add another 120 tons. It included installing a nine-foot range finder in a control position at the head of the foremast, the guns for having follow the point of sights, fitting the six-inch guns to have a one-inch, have one degree rather than a half a degree depression, and fitting the after four-inch guns so that they could fire right aft. Mounting four machine guns, maximums, instead of one, adding a second searchlight, projector, on the after platform or engine room hatch, adding a six-foot screen with open ports between the upper deck guns and across the deck in a wake of the engine hatch and installing magazine cooling already provided by a cedar class. These changes require another foot of beam. This is how a ship comes into existence. It starts off with one thing and then people start adding to it and working out improvements and they go well we've already added this so we might as well add that because that's not much more and that's a far better improvement than the other. Finally, British warships. Mm. The Washington and 1930 London Naval Treaties effectively extended the frontline service of the other capital ships of the fleet for much longer than would otherwise have been the case. While in theory, at least, this kept the major battleship fleets in a state of technical equality, the vulnerability of the older ships to aerial underwater attack considerably reduced their acceptability for modern conditions. This problem was addressed by the Washington Treaty Allowance of 3,000 tons per ship for defensive only modernization. The British ships for which modernization was considered essential were the 15 inch gun battleships and battle cruisers, the older 13 and a half inch ships, having limited expected life. The primary requirements were for the provision of bulges and deck armor, but financial limits meant that both could not be provided simultaneously. Because the ship's concern required the higher stability provided by the addition of bulges in order to accommodate the extra top weight of deck armour, it was essential to bulge the ships first and leave the armour for fitting at a later date, as and when funds became available. This had the additional financial advantage that the bulging process was cheaper than fitting deck armour. In addition to these measures, improvements were required in AA defence and modifications to provide protection against gas, known as collector defence. The ships given higher priority for modernization were the five Queen Elizabeth class bar uh, battleships. The remaining ships had already been fitted with bulges, except for Royal Oak and Renown, whose refits were already on the way. The principal bulging refits of this period were as follows Royal Oak, 1922 to 4, Renown, 1923 to 6, Warspike, 1924 to 6, Queen Elizabeth, 1926 to 7, Malaya, 1927 to 9, Valiant, 1929 to 30, Barham, 1931 to 4. It always interests me 
the simplistic arguments you get about Britain post World War One and pre World War Two, especially when it comes to the treaty of things. There are so many choices made, but the treaties do limp down on choices. And one of the big things they limit down on is the production of battleships and of ships in general. Would we have seen the same pace of construction as we saw prior to World War I if there hadn't been for the treaties? I honestly don't think there would have been. I honestly think the Anglo-American portion of the naval race had already been going on. This is what people forget. But I made this point when we talked about the when I was doing the Dreadnought series, and I'll make this point again and again and again until people start listening. More than just the lovely people who already follow my channel, but everyone starts listening. The Dreadnought race was not an Anglo-German affair. It was an Anglo-American, Italian, German, Japanese. And I would argue Brazilian affair. And you have to remember that whilst, yes, Germany was building dreadnoughts in numbers, they weren't the ones pushing the gun, gun, gun calibers up. That was the Americans, that was the Italians. The Royal Navy was responding to them. The, the Royal Navy doesn't need to jump up to 13, uh, 13 and a half. It really doesn't. It's 12s ranking at roughly the same as the 11s, and it's far cheaper to build a 12 inch battleship and sustain a fleet which is entirely 12 inch battleship than it is to start sustaining multiple types of ordnance. They jump up because of the construction work done by other nations. And then they jump up again because it's happening again. The Americans are starting to look at 14 inch, the British jump up 15 inch. My whole discussion point over HMS Argencourt, the whole point of looking at the treble turrets versus possibly its 18 inch, 18 inch guns, what are they going? And I think it probably was the 18 inch guns. Still, I'm still leaning that side because I think the treble turrets they just weren't implementing. And I don't think that's a big enough technical issue. The whole reason I'm doing it, the Germans are just about cranking out a 15 inch battleship. A one. The British are building. 13? 16 if you include Argent Corps? Or 14 if you include, Ar uh, 14 if you include Argent Corps? Hmm? It just... Yeah, that, that, that's lost. That's not... The, the British have no reason to jump beyond 15 inch at that point. Not for the Germans. But for the Italians... And the Americans, who are jumping up, the Americans are looking at 16 inch. There are honestly people who come in and go, oh, well, then the next logical thing for the British to do is jump to 16 and a half inch. But the trouble is, think about how that sounds. And just think about this from the ego of the British Admiralty's perspective, okay? And British politicians' perspective. The Americans are building 16 inch battleships. We are responding with 16 and a half inch. Does that sound petty to you? Sounds terribly petty. Americans are building 16 inch battleships. We are responding with an 18 inch bear mast. Oh. It sounds more likely, doesn't it? 18 inch guns. They make more sense. Uh, 
I often wonder what the world would look like if the treaties hadn't been put in place. I wonder if the British would have kept building battleships and battle cruisers in the form and shape of what would become the Nelrod class, Nelrods, but of course G threes and M threes, and whether they continue building them in that shape, they develop a sort of British style, and how that would impact other nations. I imagine what would be the impact of an eighteen-inch battleship coming into service in the Royal Navy. And what anyone else in the world would do and react. I imagine how quickly Japan might have gone bankrupt trying to keep up with Britain and America doing this technological race. Because it wouldn't be a numbers race, it'd be a tech race, and that's even more expensive. Because for Japan, with their lower industrial capacity, they can't build things as quickly. So in order to stay relevant to the industrial uh, to the tech, uh, tech race, they have to keep jumping a couple of steps. They're going to take longer to build it. So if they're going to be relevant when they launch, they have to be not building for this step, but building for the next a step beyond that constantly. They have to constantly have people taking double the space with less energy and less resources to do the run up. And why do I wonder about that when I'm a historian and I spend my life researching what actually happened? Why do I wonder about the roads didn't go? Because once you close off that avenue, that avenue of traditional, how Britain has done empire, imperial policing, how it's done all its jobs traditionally, it has to start coming up with a different way. I would argue the point at which the British way of war becomes infinitely more complicated, it goes back to the original book, is the implementation of the treaty system. Because the British way of war is not just about war fighting, it's about peace fighting. It's about deterrence. It's about managing the risk of conflict. It's about diplomacy and presence and reach. It's about all those things and more. It's about procurement. And the moment you start, you place limitations on that procurement, you limit yourself. And then I start to wonder if the government of the time which signed up to it understood that they were doing that. What was their vision for this treaty? It was to buy them some years of peace, to buy them some stability. It's mean they could spend money on building a land fit for heroes rather than spending money on war. It means they could spend money and they could pay down the debt more quickly. All are good and worthy things. But are they really worth undermining your entire strategic security basis? Your entire basis for strategic security. It's not World War I which does the British in in terms of causing irreparable damage. It's what comes after World War One, And not even the treaties cause irreparable damage. I think the treaties could have been managed better. I think to an extent the British government undervalued their hand and I think to an extent BT and that sounds always, I'm also accused of BT bashing, I'm not, but I, on this occasion, I'm just saying reasonably him as his, uh, his first sea lord, and I think he regretted this decision, misunderstood the impact of these treaties would have. I think you don't go into a treaty 
and sign away your cards for nothing. I think cancelling things like the Admiral class, cancelling uh, anything really, if you can't uh, cancelling the Admirals as a class as a sign of good faith, what does that get you? Good faith? That doesn't get you anything in negotiations. There's a naivety. A naivety, the en naivety that just beggars belief in some of the decisions made. Right. So, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it's given you some things to think about. The books are all going to have links to them down below in the description. And, well, this is going to go live at 6. So I hope you enjoyed watching it. And if I'm able to make it on the brew ships and get the Wi-Fi and everything working, I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And I will look forward to chatting with you. And I hope you all have a lovely time. And if for some reason brew ships doesn't work, I don't manage to get the Wi-Fi to work and give you a, make it go live, then I hope you've had a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for watching. Thank you for caring for my channel. Thank you for listening. And I will see you later in the week. There are plenty of recorded videos coming. Take care. Thank you. And have a nice evening and hope to be chatting with you shortly.